Welcome and welcome. You're on She the People. I'm Shani Chopra. Really delighted to have with me uh, an author, an activist, and the founder of Apne Aap, Ruchira Bhutta, who's written a brand new book, yet another book, that talks about how young women could stand up for their own rights, raise their voice, and prove to the world that the shift is truly underway, but not without struggle or suffering or pain. But let's deep dive into this journey of Ruchira's and how she has created this character, a diamond in the rough, a character called Hira. Ruchira, wonderful to have you here with us on She the People. My first question to you, why this book? Why now? I wrote I Kick and Head Fly because I wanted to inspire young people. I wanted to educate older people. And I wanted to create a conversation between young and young and old and young about a subject which is in plain sight but invisible. Uh, it's human trafficking. The backdrop of my book is the organized crime of sex trafficking. And the foregrounding is done through a 14-year-old girl called Hira, who's from a nomadic tribe on the border of Nepal in a little agricultural town in Forbisganj in Bihar. She is uh, about to be sold into prostitution when the cattle fair comes to town. And she's being bullied at school, and she's hungry, she can't focus on class. Um, and finally, when she's expelled from school for kicking out the teeth of a class bully, she knows her days are numbered. My plot is about how this girl escaped the sex trade with the help of Kung Fu. Now, you'll wonder, like, how can this happen? How can a girl escape the sex trade with the help of Kung Fu? Of course, there are many factors at play. And those factors are a mother who fights for her daughter, a woman's right advocate who believes that uh, the power of our body can help us discover other powers in our sense, and enrolls this girl, Hira, in a Kung Fu program, a hostel, uh, which is a place which is safe for girls like Hira to study and find protection from the traffickers who try and kidnap them. And of course, a red light area, which is full of mud huts and uh, clients coming in day in and day out among the hunger and poverty and uh, you know, just threats every single day. So my story is about kidnapping. It is about um, bullying, body shaming. Uh, it is about sexual abuse. Many things which all young people face. You know, you call this a plot, but this is the reality of every woman. Mine, yours, many other women. We go through this every single day. I believe, believe that great literature is what gets under our skin and has the power to change hearts and minds. I have been working all my life against sex trafficking. And I keep hearing answers like, oh, men will be men. Prostitution is as old as the hills. Uh, if a poor woman earns some money from prostitution, what's the harm? But because I've worked through my NGO up and up in the red light districts of India, I've actually met girls who prostitution does harm because there is physical and mental health consequences of repeated body invasion, right? I have met, no girl I have met has said that she wants to grow up to be a prostitute. She wants to be a doctor, a scientist, a lawyer or teacher. I also know through the work I have done, through real life experiences in my NGO, that we can succeed if we challenge organized crime and patriarchy girl by girl and law by law, which is what I've done. These girls who I put through school actually succeeded in finishing school, going to college. Some of them are chefs, uh, some are gas station managers, Domino's pizza parlor managers, nurses, uh, lawyers, teachers, of course. One is even a police officer. So I saw this change happen. Yeah. And I wanted to challenge the inevitability of prostitution by sharing this true story. But I know that whenever I present data, I say, oh, I've had 20,000 women exit systems of prostitution. Nobody gets it. Yeah. If I say I've had thousands of girls through school and got it, fine. But a story which shares the feelings and the emotions of a young girl and a community as they go through all this, I am sure it will affect people's understanding. And that's what I want to do. And also, you know, the other thing is that uh, great literature is based on truth. And this, my literature is based on both hope and truth because my girl does not end up trafficked. She ends up triumphant as a born veterinarist and much more. And she'll do much more. I don't want to, you know, it's a spoiler side of Yes, it. yes. 
Why are you wanting to talk to young women today? The timing of it, the choice of the audience. Talk to me about that. You know, that's why I wrote my book, I Kick and I Fly, through the voice of a 14-year-old girl. And the main characters uh, who she interacts with are also young people. Her brother, who is just a year older than her. He's a 15-year-old boy. Her classmate who becomes a bully. Uh, he's also just another 14-year-old boy. And these three people, and then her friend, Rosie, who was missing. So all of them are young people, the main characters in my book. And the reason is that human trafficking, which the United Nations says is the second largest crime in the world, is victimizing 49 million people in our world today. Of these, 70% are female and young, recruited as young people between the ages of 9 and 30. So I wanted to share uh, with young people what happens to young people their age. I also wanted to break the silence about issues um, of body shaming, bullying, sexual abuse with young people because things happen to them which nobody talks to them about. You know, they'll say, and in this case, you know, we can use the book to find cues and talk in an extreme situation like that of Hira in a red light area, but also be able to... Um, understand and find clues to answers that be questions that we have in our own lives right of course so uh, when a kid reads this they will understand that they are not crazy the system is crazy it's a broken system and they can fight back so one was to share answers the other one was to provide clues and the third is to inspire that you can fight back and standing up to injustice is possible and winnable and I also wanted to trigger a conversation between adults and young people. And my book is, of course, a social justice adventure because it's a very fast pace. It's a page turner, right? So I wanted young people to engage with the book. But I also want to educate older people about these issues through the book. Yeah. And uh, for older people and younger people to be able to have a conversation with each other. Along with the book, I've created resources with the help of Scholastic uh, which are actually for old people, parents and teachers, so that they don't feel as uncomfortable. Yeah. And I think by breaking the culture of silence, I can change the end. And this is a story of hope. So, you know, it's an easy way to talk to young people about a difficult subject. The part about this book that I love the most is how it brings out the idea of strength, physical strength, the Kung Fu that this girl is obsessed with and how that brings the change in her life, emotional strength, all of that plays out after that. Why did you choose the idea of that sport, that determination in her? Bodily autonomy has always been very important to me as a woman, as an activist, as a feminist, you know, because very often we are shamed because of our bodies. You know, all my life people would tell me, Sit properly, don't bite your legs, don't laugh loudly, you know, bend your shoulders, you know. Uh, the shame of just being a woman, like, you know, are, are we supposed to hide our breasts? Are we supposed to sit in a certain way, laugh in a certain way? So I used to get irritated by all these messages that I would get. Yeah. And then I saw that other young people are also facing the same thing. You know, body shaming is part of controlling a person, right? So it may not happen in a situation in a brothel, but it happens to every woman. You know, you're too fat, you're too thin, you're this, you're that. Uh, don't sexualize your personality, blah, 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 right? And that does something to our self-esteem. And what happens to our minds and our heart then controls our actions externally because we tend to then do better than what our potential as human beings is. Yeah. So I found that in my own work, in my NGO of Mayang, that I had to help these girls overcome the shame of their bodies. They hated their bodies because they thought they would be sold for that. Yeah, they would be exploited for that. So in uh, Bihar, I saw two uh, karate teachers in a ri rice field, you know, when I was going to my community center teaching karate to some people. So I stopped and asked them, I said, will you come to my hostel and my community center to take karate classes? And they agreed. And it really helped the girls because they were first generation learners. And uh, they were not able to compete in class the way the other kids were doing, right? So that was also part of the reason they didn't want to go to school or they would drop out or other children would bully them. But in karate, they were doing very well because they came from a nomadic tribe which knew tightrope tight walking, uh, which knew wrestling. Many of them were pehelwans and all that, you know. 
so uh, they were able to uh, be agile flexible fight and all of that and one girl t- told me in my ngo that learning self defense taught me that i have a self worth defending uh, oh how nice and so i put that quote into my book as well so my book is really based on true life stories of girls like hira and i called her hira for two reasons you know this is another story of itself so hira means diamond yeah you know? and my hira is an untouched diamond you know and with karate and kung fu she becomes this polished person who learns to control her energy within to balance with her energy outside that's why i quote bruce lee all the time in my book yeah because she has to learn she's to to be a street fighter is impulsive loses the fights because she's impulsive but once she learns to center her chi and control her energy which is what she learns from bruce lee quotes right and the bruce lee book she becomes a better fighter isn't the genesis of all of this in the fact that we as women are taught to raise ourselves as bodies that must be presented for somebody else's pleasure or use but not one that we know not one that we trust or believe it not one that we start loving or get familiar with in fact uh, you know that's a fantastic question and it requires a separate interview maybe on on its own yeah because uh, hira my character is not the only one in her strip lane you know with brothels on both sides and side point hearts right and every girl in that lane is being taught that when you attain puberty uh, you are going to be sold into the sex trade and this is what your body is worth and so on of them at very early ages are taught to desexualize the personality and then sexualize it and they begin to hate this contradiction inside themselves and they begin to suffer from fear from shame and guilt that i my body is the reason that i have to have, you know go through this shame and they fear it so there is this almost what we call a detachment from the self and the body right uh-huh. and uh, there is a psychological term called out of body experiences so very often when we create this alienation in a very extreme case between the self and the body then what happens is that women begin to experience out of body experiences right yeah so they say that we were not there you know we were looking at the sky when the customer was on us etc etc and it happens in many other situations also so uh, we have to help girls particularly and also people from sexual minorities overcome the shame of uh, the body because we unless we set ourselves free from fear shame and guilt we can never fulfill our full potential as human beings on planet earth so jira what is your advice to women about taking charge of their health their physical and emotional well-being so women are uh, taught from the time they are born that uh, they have to serve somebody else uh, you know at the moment we are born we are taught that it's all right for one class of human beings to order and one to obey it's all right for one class of human beings to give approval for work that is done and the other one to seek approval for the work that is done or all right for one class of human beings to decide what must be done and the other class of human beings to execute it so gender digs a trench into our brain into which all other inequalities fall because we begin to think that hierarchy is normal there is someone who will order and someone who will obey there is someone who will say and someone who will execute right and so we begin to think all other hierarchies are okay so we begin to accept the hierarchy of caste of race of other things you know and we begin to imagine that the structure of power is the head of the household who's a man and whatever he says right or wrong we must believe in it so we go out longing to replicate that same structure of power because that's our comfort zone so we begin to look for the same structure of power even in politics a head of the household for the entire country we want that same kind of person right uh, and uh, so we are not able to imagine a different kind of power structure where there can be correlation coexistence and also um, what i call you know gender roles are very segregated right men must be breadwinners and women must be uh, 
caretakers or uh, caregivers, right? So, uh, what happens is that it deprives both men of the, and women of possibilities. Because, you know, if a man doesn't become a breadwinner, we tell him, oh, you're sissy, you're not man enough, right? And if a woman wants to break out, then, oh, you're too ambitious, you know, you are uh, greedy, selfish, all kinds of things, right? Mm -hmm. But imagine a world in which there is no gender roles which are stereotype, right? So a woman can be a breadwinner and a man can be a caregiver. It will make men more gentle and we will truly have gentle men. And it will free them from toxic masculinity and it will make women understand all the powers. So human coming will benefit with everybody understanding every part of the body. Yeah. yeah. You know, if you need truth bombs, Ruchira Gupta is the go-to person. Thanks so much for bringing up some of those important points. My final question to you is really about sisterhood. We need more women to help other women. Last year, I wrote this book called The Sisterhood Economy just to reflect on how when women come together, magic happens. And so does money. So does economic progress. Why is it important for that women's collective to come together? Because we need more space in the media and in the corporate sector and in politics to be able to get our message across. We know that there is nothing more powerful than a group of women who come together. Women's collective action has changed not just the life of the individual women, but of societies and of countries. And uh, now there is something called feminist foreign policy in which women are less likely to make war, uh, have budget allocations for culture, education, child care and food, which men are more likely to invest in uh, arms and defense and things like that. So we know that women's collective action can have a major impact on planet Earth and in the life of families and individual women, but we just don't have unleashed the power. Such a pleasure, Ruchira Gupta. All the best for this book. And thanks for being with us here on Sheila Peep.